and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm your host, Lisa Pugh. Assembly Majority Leader Jim Steinecke came into office in 2010 as part of the Tea Party wave, and he counts among his proudest accomplishments investments in mental health and homelessness, along with bipartisan law enforcement reforms in the wake of the George Floyd murder. He's been also a harsh and public critic of 2020 election deniers. He's here with us today to talk about all of those things. Welcome, Representative Steinecke. Thanks for having me. So you come into the legislature in 2010, shortly thereafter, Act 10 is introduced, a particularly contentious time, mm. some would say the most contentious time in our legislative history. Have things gotten better over these last 10 years? Uh, in ways they've gotten better, in some ways I think they've gotten worse. Uh, I think the, the political divide that we saw, uh, especially within the building, during Act 10 uh, has subsided a bit. I think that there's more conversations between Republicans and Democrats in the legislature. Um, most of the bills that we put uh, on the floor are bipartisan in nature. I think upwards of 90% of the bills that get passed uh, are bipart bipartisan. Um, but in some ways it's gotten worse. The political atmosphere, I think nationally and here in the state, uh, people outside of the building, I, I think people's um, you know they're frayed. They're they're. Uh, uh, I think some of the divisions that are occurring in the state and the country outside of the legislature are um, really negative and having an impact on on politics. Recently on Twitter, you celebrated the 11th anniversary of Act 10. Do you think Act 10 contributed to some of those wounds in the legislature? Sure. I think you know the the political divisions that occurred during the Act 10 debate. Uh, held over for a good year or two after that. And I, I think that had, uh, you know, just that process had a, a negative effect on uh, the legislature's ability to work, you know, uh, together with both sides. Uh, but like I said, I think that subsided after the first year or two, and we were able to come to some common uh, agreement on how do floor debates were going to work and working with each other on legislation. So I, th I think that improved over time. Any regrets about how Act 10 was handled by members of your party? No, I, I think I, I think it's done what we anticipated it was going to do as far as saving taxpayers money. I, you know, I wish school districts were taking, uh, utilizing more of the tools that they have, uh, you know, in the toolbox now in order to uh, utilize merit pay for teachers and really advance good teachers as they uh, progress throughout their careers. So I think there's some disappointment, at least for me, on, on how that's played out. Um, but I think overall the, uh, the legislation has acted the way it is intended to. You are leaving later this year, leaving this seat, and so now we're talking about your kind of your achievements, your legacy, your proudest accomplishments. You have said that you're pretty proud of the bipartisan law enforcement reforms that came out of the Speaker's Task Force on Racial Disparities, and that was created after the George Floyd murder, mm -hmm. the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha. Uh, we are going to watch a clip of you as co-chair of that committee. Sure. But I've said all along in this committee, and we've talked to committee members prior to even putting this task force together, that we were going to need consensus. So yes, everybody is, if, if there is a significant portion of this subcommittee that is not on board with something, whether it's one side or the other, then we're not gonna move forward with a recommendation, right? So the idea is to come together to try to figure that out. I And I've been prepared, and I think I've said all along, I give everybody on the task force credit because everybody has moved a little bit. Everybody is, has seemingly wanted to come to uh, some kind of a consensus. We're not, I said all along too, that we're not going to get, you're not, nobody's going to get 100% of what they want. It's not, it's not possible in this kind of environment. I have to go to Representative Stubbs first. That task force really dealt with some very difficult issues at a very difficult time. What, chokeholds, use of force, no-knock warrants, body cameras. You talk in that clip about no one getting 100% of the, what they want. Was there something that you wanted that didn't make it through that task force? Not really. I mean, I didn't come in with a personal agenda, and I, I think that was uh, that was important. I think for both 
Representative Stubbs and I coming into this, the, the main goal was to try to bring people together and find consensus among these issues. And I think that's one of, one of the things I'm proudest of is that both law enforcement and people representing communities of color from around the state, uh, I, I'm sure they all came in with preconce preconceived ideas on where they were on each individual topic. Uh, but was, what was most impressive is they were willing to listen to each other and learn from each other and uh, come to consensus around how to move forward. And uh, it, was a, it was a difficult process, uh, very emotional at times, um, but it was also one I'm really proud of because the people that came to the table really wanted to make a difference. And I, th I think they did a, a good job uh, coming up with these whole list of legislative ideas that uh, a lot of them have become law. I think that's, it was a testament to the process. Did you learn anything yourself personally as you listen to testimony and the different perspectives of your task force members? Yeah, I think it's impossible not to learn something uh, from that process. Uh, just the different perspectives. You know, I had conversations with uh, people outside of that process too during this whole thing where I had conversations with a number of uh, players from the Packers organization and um, people from the Brewers organization and others uh, from around the state that just had a different perspective, things that I never thought of, uh, and quite frankly, at times, things that I didn't understand. Uh, so just having an open mind and listening to, to people as they uh, told me their perspectives on these issues uh, certainly opened my eyes on things. Is there an example of something that now you're like, oh, I didn't know that before? I think it, it, it's more the uh, attitude towards law enforcement in general. That That's, that's something that I didn't uh, quite comprehend how communities of color can see law enforcement different than uh, a lot of people in the state. And, um, you know, so I, I think that was eye-opening for me because you know, I always assumed that everybody can agree that 99% of the law enforcement is on the uh, on the street for the right reasons, trying to do the right things. And I learned that when I said that in, in one of the meetings uh, or one of the discussions I had with individuals that they don't necessarily believe that it's that high. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that I, you know, hopefully we can all um, listen and learn from other people with different opinions. Another thing you've praised about that work really is the bipartisan agreement. You mentioned your work with uh, Representative Stubbs. Why isn't there more of that sort of bipartisan work on big issues like that in the legislature? It's a good question. I don't. I don't know. I. I, I think on these. Uh, on these kind of, uh, whether it's a speaker's task force or it's a legislative study committee on certain topics, I think that's the way we really have to tackle some of these bigger issues because. Um, you know, just being able to bring people together that are from outside of the legislative arena, outside of politics in general, I think it helps in those conversations. Representative Stubbs did an amazing job during this whole process. Uh, she was a great partner on this task force and she came to it with the right mindset that, you know, we're gonna set aside our political divisions at the door when we walk through that door and have these discussions. Uh, we're gonna try to be unbiased uh, people that are just trying to facilitate a conversation, and that's that's why I think it works so well. Some people think that the way the maps are drawn for representation contribute to the hyperpartisan nature of the legislature. Sure. Recently, the state Supreme Court, as you know, approved Governor Evers' proposed maps, and members of the GOP are um, contesting that. They are calling the governor's maps racially gerrymandered. Are the proposed Republican maps gerrymandered? No, I, I think, you know, the, during our, our process, we didn't look at racial data at all. Um, I think that's clear that in the governor's process that they did. And his process in developing the maps that went before the Supreme Court was done completely in secret behind closed doors with no public input. Uh, he did have the People's Maps Commission, which put forward a product that was resoundingly rejected by both Republicans and Democrats in the legislature. But then for this court case, he put forward maps that nobody's nobody had seen before. And I, I don't think it's just members of the GOP that are pushing back against those maps. It's also Senator Taylor. So there's bipartisan opposition to the maps that the Supreme Court ended up adopting. 
there's been a lot of criticism that the existing maps are gerrymandered, and I think there's been back and forth about that. Mm -hmm. Is that a valid criticism? I don't think so. I mean, when you look at the state, even under Governor Evers' maps, whether it was the People's Commission maps or the maps that uh, the Supreme Court adopted, um, there's significant Republican majorities just because of the ge geography of Wisconsin. Most Democratic voters seem to pack themselves into urban areas. Uh, the rest of the state, more rural areas, are, tend to be more conservative. It's really difficult to draw maps that would result in a 50-50 split in the legislature because you'd actually have to gerrymander the seats in order to get there. You'd have to uh, have pie-shaped, uh, somewhat pie-shaped seats around urban areas where you would pull, uh, you know, the people that live in those urban areas and mix them with people that are out in the suburbs. I think it would violate every constitutional test of making sure districts are compact, contiguous, and keeping communities of like interest together. Is there such a thing as a fair map that you could go back in your district and talk to Republicans and Democrats and say, get agreement on? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a good question. <clears throat> you know, Governor Evers had an opportunity during this People's Maps Commission to, to show that uh, a commission like that could work. Well, then when they came out with their product, again, it was resoundingly rejected by both sides because they violated the Voting Rights Act and several other uh, constitutional tests. So... I don't know how that would work, and I don't know that this mythical nonpartisan body uh, is out there somewhere. Um, if it is, I don't think we've seen it, uh, but you know, it's something I, I don't think that there's widespread opposition to finding a process or finding a different way of doing things. It's just how you craft that, and I'm just not sure we have the answer on that. So our, fa our state is facing historically high gas prices, inflation. Uh, there's also a historically high state surplus. We have a healthy rainy day fund. The governor said, let's provide a tax refund. Why is now not the time to get a tax refund to Wisconsinites? I think Wisconsinites, if you ask them, would they rather have a $150 check this summer or wait until the first of the year when we can do more structural tax reform to bring down their taxes permanently. I think most people want their taxes reduced permanently versus getting a $150 check in the mail. Uh, as we've seen, $150 at the gas pump doesn't go very far these days. Uh, so structural reform is, is something that I think is necessary to our tax code and something that I think will benefit everybody in the long run if we do it. Uh, might be a little bit longer process, but I think it'll be more permanent that way. So if people look back and say, a tax refund was supported when Governor Walker was on office, but you're not supporting it now. It's just a timing issue? Yeah, I mean, I think so. We're, we're heading into a time where, like you said, we have historic revenues into the state. I think that's a credit to the policies we've enacted over the course of the last 11 plus years. Um, we were told back in, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago that the more we cut taxes, we would starve Wisconsin government of revenues. Well, we've seen just the opposite. We continue to cut taxes. We continue to get more revenue into state coffers. Um, so I, I think looking forward, we have to continue on the same path. Even though, you know, it might be a political win to send out checks right before an election, I think long-term structural tax reform is more important. You'll continue watching that when you're lo no longer in office. I will. I will. The 2020 election continues to be d divisive within your party. Mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, you've written about this, talked about this many times. So we are going to pull up a tweet from you from earlier this year. Um, you say, I have 10 months remaining in my last term. In my remaining time, I can guarantee I will not be part of any effort. We'll do everything possible to stop any effort to put politicians in charge of deciding who wins or loses elections in a world where partisan divides are deep and seemingly anything can be justified as long as it results in retaining power, handing authority to partisan politicians to determine if election fraud exists would be the end of our republic as we know it. Mm. Why did you say that? Because I, I believe it's true. Um, you know, I, I believe as, as much as our nonpartisan legislative audit bureau uh, showed that there were some issues in the last election, I believe Joe Biden won the election here in Wisconsin, I believe he won it nationally. Um, but I also believe that things, some things need to be corrected going forward in order to ensure people have faith in elections. 
Um, so I think I think that stuff is important. But putting politicians in charge of who wins or loses elections, it's just a bad idea. Uh, you put somebody in there that has some sort of self-interest or some kind of partisan uh, bent. I mean, imagine the pressure they would have been under if there was a Republican in charge of this determining the uh, last election results and what occurred after that. There would have been an enormous pressure on that individual. So I think as, as uh, flawed as our system may be in some ways, we still have uh, one of the most secure uh, voting systems in the country here in Wisconsin. And I think we just have to make some minor changes to make sure that the law is followed and people can have faith in the elections going forward. You've also been critical of people who've called to decertify the 2020 election. Uh, former Supreme Court Justice Gableman has, had called for that in his recommendations in his recent report. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of that report and investigation. You've called decertification a fool's errand. Why keep funding the Gableman investigation? Speaker Voss just renewed that. Yeah, I think I think the uh, thing that we're trying to attempt to uh, get to is take the um, nonpartisan legislative audit bureau report where it showed some issues, allow uh, the Gableman investigation to look a little d deeper into those because the, the legislative audit bureau didn't dig into every single one of those issues in, in an expansive way. So I think that was the goal of the Gableman election or uh, investigation. Um, Isn't it time for it to end? I, we would all like it to end, uh, quite frankly, but there are still some lawsuits out there uh, surrounding some of these issues as far as the subpoenas and other things that those have to be wrapped up. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we have to continue to look forward, not backwards, and we have to move on as quickly as we can. Do you wish it would be done? Uh, I, I wish this whole 2020 election thing uh, stuff would be done because we have to continue to look forward at 2022 and 2024, but we also have to make sure people have confidence in their, in their elections. And I think that falls on elected officials to push back against misinformation, this whole decertifying the election. It's just not possible um, and not, it should, shouldn't be something that the legislature has involvement in anyway, because imagine for those people that are pushing for decertification today, if uh, legislatures had that ability to do that in the past, would they have decertified the election in 2016 or the Gore-Bush uh, election of 2000? I mean, Dangerous where path. does it end? Where does it end? So. As a Republican, these are you've been, been to it, taking some pretty strong public positions. Do you get any pushback back home from some constituents? You know, a handful here and there, but a vast majority of the people in my district have been uh, very supportive over the years. Uh, that's why I've never, never felt like uh, I need to um, not say what I believe. I've always felt like uh, elected office is is something that is a privilege shouldn't be something that people stay in for a career and you shouldn't certainly make decisions based on uh, what's gonna happen in the next election. Uh, I, I feel as a representative of the people, I, I have a responsibility to tell them the truth and I'll always try to do that. You've also been critical of your assembly colleague, uh, Representative Rantham, who Rantham, who is running for governor. Is his candidacy dangerous to the party? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that he's, he's gaining any traction. I think it's because a vast majority of people understand that what he's pushing isn't possible and it's, it's not constructive. Um, so we'll see going forward uh, how much influence his candidacy has on the election, but uh, I have a feeling it's going to be pretty minimal. Moving on from that topic, you've talked about another thing that you're really proud of is your work on the issue of homelessness and in 2017 you uh, created this interagency council on homelessness which has continued under governor evers we have a clip of some comments you made on the assembly floor about that this conservative approach shows that we respect taxpayers but more importantly we show the homeless advocacy community and homeless individuals themselves that we're committed to changing the conversation around here it saves the taxpayers money. It connects homeless individuals with stable housing and meaningful employment. Obviously, we all know that meaningful, uh, stable housing is the first step to meaningful employment. And we are going to get people to work and relieve them from dependence on government. So 
I appreciate all the support that we've gotten since these bills were introduced. Um, I hope you'll see your way clear to support the rest of the package because I think these are all important steps uh, as we all fight together to help end homelessness in Wisconsin. Thank you. So that interagency council that you created, they just issued their new 2021-2023 statewide action plan. It looks like there's been some improvement. The pandemic complicates the homelessness issue, but there's still been a 10% increase in the number of sheltered and unsheltered people experiencing chronic homelessness. How do you respond to people say, we're just not doing enough? Yeah, I, it, it's, I, I don't know that you can ever do enough, right? I mean, one of the things that uh, I was most proud about in this whole package was uh, the coordination with Lieutenant Governor Clayfish at the time. Uh, Rebecca Clayfish had a big influence on this whole process and was really a champion of this in the administration. Uh, so it made it much easier to get this package through, a package that addressed homelessness for the first time in really decades. Under both Republican and Democratic governors, uh, there hadn't been much done over the course of the previous two or three decades on homelessness. So, um, you know, we, we got the original package through. Uh, we continue to work on it. Uh, got some more things done in this last session, but didn't get, get everything done that we wanted to see done. Uh, there's always going to be things that we need to do, and especially in, an, uh, in rough economic times like we're dealing with now with high gas prices and high cost of living, the inflation uh, off the charts. I, I, I think it's going to be something we're going to have to continue to work on for, for years, really. Democrats have criticized GOP changes to public benefit programs, saying that you know some of those changes really have contributed to making it harder for people who might be homeless to get ahead. How do you respond to that? I, I just I, I think it's misunderstanding the the circumstances out there and, and what legislation does. Really, what vast majority of the legislation we push to that end has been about uh, able-bodied individuals without dependent children. And with the number of jobs that are available out there in the state right now, uh, really the effort is to get people that are sitting on the sidelines now back into the workforce. Um, this, there isn't a reason right now where individuals can't find jobs because every, literally every employer I talk to is, is looking for, for people to work. And we need to do what we can to get them back into the workforce and being contributing members of society again. It's not only good for the state, but it's good for the individuals as well. Um, so dependence on government isn't something that we should uh, encourage. It's something uh, there should be a safety net for there for people that fall on hard times. But uh, that, as Governor Walker has said in the past, that uh, safety net can't be, become a hammock. We have to make sure that we move people from assistance to independence as quickly as we can. Would you support additional, now you're not going to be there, but, <laughs> right. but should the next budget include more funding to address homelessness issues? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've pushed for that in uh, the last uh, several, several years, haven't always been successful. Um, but I do think that we need to continue to do more. We have to be careful in what we do and that we measure it to make sure that uh, there are good results. We can't just throw money at this issue and expect it to go away. Uh, we have to put forward innovative programs uh, that make sense, uh, pilot them, see what the results are, and if they're effective, expand them. If they're not effective, then get rid of them. And I think that's, uh, that's the key to attacking this issue. Another thing I know that you're proud of are investments in children's mental health. You worked with Senator Darling back in 2014 to create something called the Child Psychiatry Consultation Program. How is that investment working? Uh, it's been phenomenal. You know, when you talk to the uh, pediatricians involved in this program, it's nearly 100% approval uh, for, the, for the process and uh, the help that they get in dealing with their uh, kids that are presenting with mental health challenges and you know based off of that we also created uh, a pilot program in Outagamie County uh, for direct help to educators and administrators in the schools so that they can also uh, get assistance with kids that are uh, presenting with mental health issues uh, they can call somebody and, and get that the help that they need in order to better deal with their students that are presenting with these issues so Again, it's, it's something that we're trying to build a framework for and continue to build off of that framework. Uh, articles and information that talk about your future plans say maybe there's an Outagamie County executive run in your future. 
what do you how do you respond yeah I mean it's I I, I wouldn't be being honest if I hadn't uh, said I if I wouldn't say that I hadn't thought about that at some point but I really think time in, in elected office has probably passed me by uh, and it's time to return to the private sector and, and fight for things there that I believe in what if someone asked you to run uh, people have, and I've said no so far. <laughs> so, so far. Yeah. So what are your future plans? What will you be doing a year from now? Well, I'm going to continue to work on uh, in my current role as a majority leader and uh, focusing on helping constituents as long as I'm in office. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, I'm obviously looking at other opportunities outside of, uh, you know, the elected office realm. Um, and we'll just see what happens. I don't have anything uh, definite planned yet. Any regrets for your time in office? Things that you're like, oh, I wish I would have done that a little differently. Yeah, I think anybody uh, can look back at things they, that they've said that in the heat of the moment that they wish they could take back. Uh, overall, I'm really proud of the work that we've done. Most proud of the, the work where we were able to bring people together from different perspectives to solve problems. Uh, happen not only in racial disparities and homelessness and uh, mental health, but uh, also on uh, minor guardianship issues. That you know there was there was uh, an issue surrounding minor guardianships that uh, has really been tried to be worked on for decades, and we were able to bring people together and, and get something done for that. So those are the things I'm most proud of, uh, just where we've been able to bring people together to make a difference. What are you? most concerned about or most hopeful about for Wisconsin's future, maybe maybe both? Yeah, I, I think we're, uh, the thing I'm most concerned about is we're, we're living in a society right now where people seem to be only talking to people that agree with them and not listening to people or not being willing to engage with people that don't agree with them. And I think that's really dangerous because I can't tell you how many times I've heard from people that say, everybody agrees with me. Well, you're not talking to enough people then. You, you really need to get out there, open up your mind, being, be willing to listen to people with differing opinions because you can learn something. I mean, that's what's happened throughout a lot of these processes that I've talked about uh, with the task forces and the study committees where- And you've applied that test to yourself. Yeah, you, you, you really have to be willing to listen to people that uh, have a different perspective or have a different opinion. You're not always going to agree, but you can get a better understanding of where they're coming from, and I think that's something that's lacking. And hopeful? Hopeful. I'm always hopeful. I mean, I think the foundation of our country is strong, uh, but we, we have to do a better job of uniting around common goals. Uh, I think we all have similar goals. Uh, we may have different ideas of how to get there, um, but that shouldn't stop the conversation. That should just be the beginning of the conversation, our ability to learn from each other and find consensus on issues I think is critical. Well, we thank you for joining us today and we wish you good luck in your future. Thank you, I appreciate it. And thank you to the viewers of Newsmakers. Be sure to tune in again as we highlight the issues and sit down with the decision makers who make a difference for all of us. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.